My name is Cecilia Rubino. I uh, coordinate the undergraduate theater program at Lang. And um, I had the great good luck of doing a whole bunch of projects with Sekou. And um, uh, for he, he also was an instigator for me in terms of bringing um, the, the work that I do with youth and with young people um, into my other practices as a professional um, um, and writing and directing. Um, so for a decade or more, I created interactive pieces um, at Lincoln Center's Meet the Artist series. Um, it's an interactive format. Um, um, young people from all over the city come uh, and uh, they asked me at one point what else uh, did I want to make or what did I want to do, not knowing anything about it, but somehow with that bug in my head that I wanted to take Seiku to kids, I said, oh, um, maybe something on poetry or salam. I didn't know anything about it, um, um, but I had the good fortune of knowing Darian Deshaun, whose uh, um, who's brainchild um, this our original format called Slam 101 came from. Um, uh, it, it's a, a sl it, So the poets, uh, um, perform poems in different genres, um, and then the young people in the audience judge them, and they are also, the young people are also incited to write and create in those particular genres. So just to introduce a little snippet of our work um, from, we're, we're now on to a trilogy. This is from Slam 102. I'm delighted to welcome um, Chanel Gabriel, Darian Deshaun, and Eric Maldonado, a.k.a. Advocate of Words from SLAM 102. I make no apologies for the velocity in my voice, the velocity in my volume, the velocity in my swag. His velocity is happening. You can Less see words see. equals more power. Words we can provoke and manipulate the laws of gravity. So I run. Run out of sentences. Let's push the sky, God, and God and air. We've got the everywhere to go, staring at the blue skies and the storms. Memories caught in the vortex, flipping up and down the rabbit hole of a tornado. My swagger. Verbal velocity. Right. Poets, countrymen, lend us your ears. I'm Chanel. I'm Eric. And I'm Darian, and this is Slam 102, Verbal, Verbal Velocity. The abridged version. Abridged, abridged. And now it's time for the Brickety, Brickety, Brickety Breakdown. Doom, 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 a poet can be inspired by many different things, even other forms of art. This is called an ekphrastic poem. A frack of what? An ekphrastic poem. A frack of who? An ekphrastic poem. What'd you just call me? You heard what she said about me? I'm an ekphrastic poem. Oh. A poem inspired by another form of art. Okay, so like a poem inspired by the Mona Lisa. Or a poem inspired by breakdancing. Yes, or a poem inspired by music. Yeah. yeah. John Coltrane makes the sax go insane. I said, John Coltrane makes the sax go insane. And we are pacing and racing towards freedom at the speed of a freight train. Prepare for flight and pack light. We are making leaps and bounds to the metropolis with superhero gusto. Spider-Man ain't got nothing on us. This is giant steps, baby. Before hip hop, there was bebop, where the beat dropped whenever, wherever we wanted to. Good luck catching up with our groove, where the only move you can make is a finger snap and a head bob, because there's no dancing tonight. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the intricacy of what chaos can be. Bet with us to the syncopation of a downtown ditty, an uptown frenzy. More than music, this is the definition of cool. The era of speakeasies and fedoras, struts and zoot suits for the languages you and your horn. And tonight, Coltrane is preaching in the church of St. Hypnus. His congregation consists of cats, dames, and daddy -os. Translators need not apply, can you dig it? This is the DNA of the city, the blood of the asphalt jungle, pumping and bumping on the sidewalk near you, on the busting streets of car horns and the the roar of motor engines, the swarm of bee taxis humming and buzzing from block to block to the underground. Zip and swish of the subway dragon. Let the notes dip and dive till we rise and arrive to a cloudless New York sky. Make friends with the looming titans of skyscrapers, towering above the puny ants known as people. Cold train is our guys. We ride high through this vastness of culture in contemporary America. And we are soaring and sailing and laughing and scatting to the melody of free. Let the rift lift you to new plateaus, beyond platitudes of what you thought music could be. This is giant steps, baby, between a man and his craft, striving and levitating the landmark levels, between horn and the human breath, the pitter-patter of fingers and buttons pressed to ignite the harmonic wail of a legend, daring to make leaps and bounds and carrying his listeners every giant step 
of the way. Thank you. It's as if her voice alone can make people move, smile, and laugh. Even those who don't understand a single word she's saying. She puts the river in my torso and waterfalls in my eyes. She is salsa, el cantante, the singer. Spread the word of the Latin culture, giving us sound bites to our own reflection. Hector Lavo sung his truth. Made me want to be cool, caring, respectful, and fuerte. Had become a bridge between me and the responsibility to mi gente. High energy and personal sacrifice, reminding me that we are all human. Salsa. I began to study her language on my own. Her greatest grandparents met during the slave trade that brought Africans over to the Caribbean and took the indigenous population of present-day Latin America over to Africa. They found rhythm in the oceans. Abuelito's percussions would ward off evil spirits and Abuelita's melody would string along good luck and peace. Most fight fire or fire, but we've always battled the enemy with love. This music was our Jackie Robinson breaking segregated barriers. Before there was Don Omar or Rico Suave, there was Tito Puente, Tito Rodriguez, Miguelito Valdez, and the music started to change the racism tides and the whites only palladium opened its doors to the cha-cha, the Argentine tango, the Cuba, rumba, the congo, and mambo, which all began to blend and created salsa. Y canto la vida de risas y penas, de momentos malos y de cosas buenas. It defined mi corazón, la arma y amor of who I am. Yo soy Latino, yo soy puertorriqueño, and I invite you all to share with me one of my ancestors' most gorgeous creations, salsa. Bailando! That, he said that no one man should have all this power. He said, he said that no one man, you listen, you listen, keep listening. He said that no one man should have all this power. This American pie, it tastes so sour. Rappers have become superheroes, pop celebrities, people we believe in. And way back when, way back when hip hop got it was about sparking change and being different. Now we're all fighting to be the same. Much respect to Kanye West for changing the status quo. Adding African drums to bring an ancient rhythm to his flow. Fluid like a pen filled with H2O. Add a soul clap. Trying to tap into the emotion today's music seems to lack. And he said that no one man should have all this power. Cause one person can't stop hip hop sweetness from going sour. Let Dwayne's melodic voice rain down like Seattle showers. Kanye's honesty gives him his power. Because the beauty of art is that art affects the heart. So rappers writing from the heart are writing just to make charts. Hip hop got to start by being boastful and proud. No censorship. Motown paved the way. Self made black music millionaires now. Hip hop fans from the West Coast to Japan got kids learning English by spitting lyrics like Konnichiwa, home skillet. Come with sign what's popping. Hip hop in every language, heads bobbing. Music as living proof of the power of human connection. Yet evidence of the power of hard work and dedication. And this is the 21st century, and no one man should have all this power. Because the power's not just his, y'all. It's ours. Our money, our dollars, our support show labels what to invest in. The platinum hits shouldn't be determined by explicit... Platinum hits shouldn't be determined by explicit lyrics and club records. Different styles should be allowed to share their gift. And no one man should have all this power. You can feel this beat in your bone marrow. I challenge you all not to be so shallow. Look for the depth in music. You have the power. <laughs> Yo, Eric. 
show us what you got. Why you, you do this? this? Hey, uh, why, why you, you do, do this? this? Hey, why, why you, you do this? this? There's velocity and brevity. Less words equals more power. What spoken manipulates the laws of gravity. So I run. Run on sentences like planes jog on air. We've got everywhere to go. Staring eye to eye with the blue skies and the storms. Memories caught in the vortex, slipping up and down the rabbit's hole of a tornado. Transporting displaced feelings phonetically like hurricanes do rules. So let it burn, verbs. Burn. Yo, Chanel. Yo, poet. Show us what you got. Why you do this? Oh, why you do this? Oh, why you do this? I spit this to be the intensity of a heartbeat. My words hit your ears with the velocity of a freight train, changing the physics of what you thought were your limits. My words speak your growth into existence, showing you that if you're looking for someone to look up to, put a mirror on your ceiling, because that someone is you. you. Believe me, because I speak the truth, no slick talk. My words hit the blackboards of your mind. I spit chalk. I spit life, gunning down adjectives, verbs, and nouns, and then I'm out of sight. Yo, Darian. Yo, poet, show us what you got. Why you do this? Hey, why you do this? Whoa, why you do this? I make no apologies for the velocity in my voice, the velocity in my volume, the velocity in my swagger. The visions I envision, you can see them if you listen. You see, it's my philosophy that verbal velocity has the candy capacity to impact the masses with words heard in the cadence of a symphony, a sudden Russian spark like astronomy, big bang theory, creation conjured by the words of a poet with a tidal wave tongue and the bravado of a banshee because in the middle of the night, a fountain pen ordered me to write it told me to write for pleasure, write for pain, write forever, write for change, write with specifics, write to be prolific, write to learn, write to grow, write to yearn, write to glow, write steady with this train of thought, write to uplift, write because it's a gift, write to believe, write at need, write, 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 because the only way you know how to make sense in a society is static, and that's why every day you go at it and write, 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 write. Now put me down and give praise to the pen, and tomorrow we'll start again, and then your dreams are here. Scribble, 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 write. Right, right, right. Thank you very much, guys. We're Slam 102. Thank you very much. And bring him back to the stage to say a Rabino. New Year. Uh, Director, sometimes DJ. <laughs> um, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Um, so, so the format that we have is really interactive. So, um, the poetry is being judged. Yeah, we'll have to take music Andrew, down just a little bit. Just a little bit. Okay. The music, just a little, please. Thank you. Cecilia uh, has a nice voice. Don't drown it out. Go ahead. All good. Yeah. Um, um, uh, we're we're a little we're a little shy on time, but we are actually um, again where the work takes you into unexpected places. Um, um, we're now on our tr third part of this trilogy. We will open a show in January at the Walter Reed um, Theater, um, a, a piece uh, which is, a, again, about different genres of poetry, but it's um, uh, uh, the imperative is that it addresses history. And um, so we haven't finished writing it, it quite yet, but um, it'll be there in January and then again in May. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions uh, about the piece um, or about process oriented. I don't know if any of you guys want to say something about our process or how we've worked on this. Well, just in the sense of what you just experienced was kind of um, word for word is what we would present to the young people. It's very much a breakdown of kind of we do, you do. So we would do those poems. Each um, We'd have selected judges. They would judge what we did. Um, and usually they're cruel, but it's all right. Um, Three we're points strong. Throw. Um, and so then they would judge it, and then we would do kind of like that breakdown, and then we'd be like, now it's your turn, um, write an ekphrastic poem. And usually we, we play um, uh, Jay-Z's Empire, um, Empire State of Mind. And so that always kind of gets them like, oh, yeah, what do you know about New York? And so we kind of do a free write from there, and um, we, get, we usually get a lot of good results. So, yeah. And usually a lot of times. Um, usually a lot. Oh, there's a question. And just saying, usually a lot of times we actually try to get this. You get the kids on stage to read the things that they created right then and there. So that's another important aspect of what we get to do. And the teachers sometimes will take that back with them. Yes, please, Gail. Um, oh, it's at Lincoln Center. Um, usually the schools are. Um, it's ages. It's um, fourth grade through high school. So we get um, various ages depending on the day um, the group. Um, sometimes we get special needs um, uh, schools, um, different different classes sometimes. So, Yeah, the schools are from all over the place. And what's actually nice is that one of the challenges is then how is it not a one-off so they're coming in for a performance. Um, what's what's a, what's cool that there are lots and lots of educators that are using poetry um, and, 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 and the format of SLAM, which is a game format. 
Um, and so Lincoln Center actually then finally came up with some funding in their new space, and they did something called Poet Link, with these poets were the judges, and um, there were students from all five boroughs that came and competed against each other. Um, yes? Now I was just wondering if you collaborated with Urban Word. They are Urban Word. work with Urban Word. Word. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We're, me and Chanel are like some of their main mentors, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the poet in residence for the year. We just had, we just had a meeting yesterday. Yeah, so, it was yeah. a yeah. billion of us. Yeah. <laughs> Aisha. Yeah, um, just more in, into what you guys just did there. How do you guys come together to create your pieces? Do you <coughs> say we want to write about this and then come together and find a way to musically make them work with each other? How does yeah, that e each um, each round we kind of we, we, we go over what kind of themes we're interested in or what type of poems. Uh, repetitive list poem, the personification the poem, poem. personification poem, and then we go in our own direction. We do how we want to, do, you know, stay true to to ourselves. I'm not going to try to write a Chanel poem. She's not going to try to write a do Darian it. poem, um, and and they cannot write a poem like me. So um, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm we joking. don't. Want so um, so basically, that's how it is. Yeah. And there is a bit of strategic planning in terms of all right. So you're going to handle the hip hop. I handle the jazz, salsa, so we, there is some negotiation like that because I want to do a hip hop piece, but you know. But it didn't. I, I think that naturally came together though. Oh, did it? With yeah, that, it with did. that yeah, round, yeah. Because you really, you yeah, liked, yeah, you and you were, you time. chose first actually, so you decided jazz. So I'm, I'm just. <laughs> By the way, like, well, jazz score is really low. Kids are like, huh? It's so. But okay. Kanye West, like ten. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they love. I mean, it's hard for me because even doing that poem, Kanye has really disappointed me over the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, that's a little dated. But, but in the same dated. breath, I, I give him credit for using his voice however he wants to use it, whether he's misusing it or not. Um, that, that being that's said, a, though, I was going to say, that, yeah, I think that the, especially when we're dealing with younger, like third graders and stuff like that, a lot of it is about just the energy of that, of like, whoa, what was that? And that was jazz. And so they have some reference to it. I think me and Advocate know going into it that we're probably going to lose that round, but it's important that they understand unless, what jazz is. Unless, uh, no. unless, unless it, it is a school filled with a bunch of Latinos, then all, <laughs> then they love it. They're like, we're there. And <laughs> okay. so, uh, but I usually lose, all right? I usually lose so um okay. so yeah one last question sure it's out in the yeah. bay area yeah. Yeah. now where are you from yeah she's from and, and he's from the bay area too so yeah. um so west coast yeah, so, um, you know, unexpectedly. But the other amazing thing about the people in this room is that there are lots of um, former students of Sekou, and so I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Um, and there are a number of presenters who are talking about how Sekou has really influenced their work and, and uh, catapult catapulted them into unexpected uh, directions. Um, thanks, you guys. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, right now, uh, we're going to hear a little bit more from some of the amazing catalysts who we've asked to come out today and participate with us in that group session that we led a little bit earlier. Um, you're going to hear from them more individually now. Um, I like to call Jeremy, Pam, Shana, and Shawadeen, and Aisha up here. Um, yeah, please give it up for them as they come up to the stage. Um, so Jeremy Syrup is the uh, Director of Education at the Central Queens Y. He's also a musician. Very good musician. I've worked with him, collaborated with him music-wise. Um, Pam is a storyteller and performance theater artist and one of my colleagues in the first year writing um, faculty program here at Eugene Lane College. Uh, Shana is um, a teacher, artist, and activist at Parsons, also a new school uh, colleague of mine. Um, Shawadim is a New York native. Uh, he's currently the, a leader, a leader and school leadership coach and a teacher at the Team Charter Program and um, Team Charter School Network in Newark. And he's going to give you an amazing presentation about the work that he does with the team. Yes, it was. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. We said in the bar high. And uh, Aisha is also a former student. Oh, and I should mention also that uh, myself, Jeremy, and Aisha um, were in Sekou's America Project class um, all together in the first and the second part of the class. It, um, you saw some of the video from that, from that course earlier today. Um, but Aisha is also going to be uh, doing a presentation about her 2050 
uh, Legacy Project. She is uh, the arts manager at Casita Maria Center of Arts and Education in the BX, in the Bronx. Um, so please uh, give them your attention and without further ado. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in memory of Sekou Sundiata. Um, what we were, we, we didn't have a class in this room, but we've been in this room many times with Sekou, seeing him, it brings back old memories. So in, in his memory, um, we're here. Anyways, um, but yeah, you know, I was thinking about the main questions of this conference, right? Um, questions pertaining to who or how do we create public projects? How do you form diverse creative projects or partnerships? How do you inspire dialogue and creative practice, pedagogy and democracy? Obviously, these are huge, huge questions. Um, but before I kind of go into my practice and how I try to strive and find answers for these large questions, which I don't think I fully have done in, in the short number of years that I've been here. Um, they're very large questions. Um, it kind of just had me thinking of how do we all have an effect, right? And I believe that, that no matter who we are and what we do, right, our beliefs affect the way we act. And our actions affect the communities that we engage in, just on a very, very simple level. Um, so whether we like it or not, we have an effect on people, good or bad. And obviously, good or bad, those are very vague, generalized terms, but they're real, right? We do things that are good. We do things that positively benefit people. We do things that are progressive. We do things that are, are peaceful, that are engaging. Um, and then sometimes our actions have bad responses, bad results, bad effects, right? Um, just because we, we may have an effect on something, just because we are acting and our actions have a reaction, it doesn't mean that that reaction or that action in the first place was something good, right? Our actions can result in, in death, can result in murder, can result in confusion. Um, so I, I think the question of responsibility comes into play. And the, the idea is for us to have a good effect, right, as opposed to a bad effect, and this takes initiative. And the act of taking initiative, in my opinion, is an act of taking responsibility. So I'm, I'm going to try to tie this all together and get, get into what it is that I do. Um, but I think this poses the question of how do we take responsibility and how do we become responsible people? And this is something that we present to our students, you know, on an elementary level. Well, how are you going to be responsible today, little, little Johnny, little Sam, little Alicia? Um, but I think these are huge questions. I, I really do, and I think that we grapple with these questions up, in, up until our later years. How are we responsible? How do we take responsibility? Um, so I think we are all here, right, with, with the intention of making some type of positive change, right? I've, I would like to think we are all trying to be responsible. We are all here because we are active in some way, shape, or form. Um, we are artists, we are educators, we are musicians, so on and so forth. And I think we've already taken the first step to have some type of positive change um, and to be responsible in some type of way. And when I look at myself, you know, um, I look at myself a as somebody who who, who needs improvement, you know? I can come here and I can tell everybody the things that I've, I've done and the work that I'm engaging in, and you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But, you know, one, one of the things I spoke about in, in our breakout groups was um, this book, you know, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, right? And Freire talks about how education is a process. You know, we are constantly changing, we are constantly reflecting. Our students are constantly changing and reflecting, but as educators, we are too. Um, and so that's something that, that kind of guides what I do. Um, but, but what is it that I do, um, and, and how do I try to be a responsible person? Um, you know, and I think that's, that's come in different stages and forms for me. At a young age, um, or a little bit younger, you know, when I was a student here, I was much more political. You know, I was very politically active in campus. I was much more rebellious. Um, and I think my expressive side was able to manifest through politics. And I think that's one way where 
myself as a creative person was able to kind of come to the table and, and manifest myself as a person with my aspirations and, and how, I wanted to, um, how I wanted to change the world, right? I'm also a musician. I think music is an excellent way um, in finding out who it is that you are and presenting who it is that you are on a, on a public spotlight. Um, but I'm also the, the educational director of the Central Queens Y, and so in that I have a great opportunity of taking my efforts, my desires, reaching out to the community, bringing students who are college-age students, high school-age students, bringing them on board, um, and allowing them to be who they are, of course, training them, bringing them up to speed on what they have to do um, inside of an after-school environment. I, I run after-school programs. And we're able to have a very collaborative experience, right? Students are interacting with our counselors. Counselors are interacting with our teachers. And um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we have a public platform where people are interacting with each other, are expressing themselves, being artistic, and progressing in some type of way. So hopefully that all, that all made sense, but thinking in the spirit of Seiku, you know, we, we think about how we are creative people and how that creation and that creativity can be seen more on a, a larger spotlight. So that's my experience. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, my name is Pamela Jackson, and uh, I used to be a former uh, Christian evangelist <laughs> uh, for six years. Uh, I would go and approach strangers uh, throughout Washington, D.C., and also here when I moved to New York City. On every train ride I had, I would go and approach people and try to convert them to Christianity. Um, and I was very adamant about that and very passionate about that. Um, and I have left that part of my life. Um, what I did enjoy about that part of my life, though, was the finding out what's inside of a person I don't know who's walking past me. And so I uh, take in that art of approaching strangers, and I approach strangers inside of my neighborhood um, in Bedside, Brooklyn, throughout this summer. I've approached them at Fulton Park, which is right off of um, on Stuyvesant and Fulton, and I asked strangers to tell me their life stories. Um, the difference from when I was an evangelist to now is that I intentionally listen without an agenda. Um, uh, there's no agenda to convert. Uh, the only agenda is to allow someone to have their story be heard. Uh, what I also ask for them is uh, a moment in their life of them overcoming something. And I take these stories and I, I gather. So Brian said I'm a storyteller. I'm actually a story gatherer. Um, so I gather all of these stories together and I look for a pattern in them, uh, a reoccurring element between one stranger's story and another stranger's story and my own, specifically around something we've overcome. And what I use this work as, this project, is inside of a movement I'm calling Resilience Theater. Um, the many different ways that we rise and fall. Um, and it's beautiful for me to see how one stranger's story is connected to another stranger and they don't even know it. Um, but as I shared in my breakout group, I'm really intentional about listening. Um, listening is a practice that I, I teach and I specifically teach it around assumption making. Uh, the assumptions that we can make that block our listening of each other. And so when I sit with these strangers, um, the result of the project is a performance of me taking on their stories and becoming them on stage and sharing their stories with others. But in the moment of the interview, the result is thank you. It felt great to be listened to. It felt great to tell my story. That's the resounding response that I get from interviewee after interviewee. And that's because with listening, when it takes place, when someone is telling you or telling me their story, there's actually a dual listening that's going on. Um, the person who's telling their story is not only telling it to me, the listener, but they're telling it to themselves. And so uh, the goal of that space 
is for folks to have their stories sort of returned back to them, empowered and affirmed by them. Um, so I love this part because I move out of the way even more and they take up the space. This is the kind of space that I create both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, and this past semester, as Brian brought up, we do the first year program and I did, I taught personal storytelling. But what I did was I brought together 18 Eugene Lang freshmen with 18 juniors and seniors from a high school in the Bronx. And as a group together, they range in ages of 16 to 20 years old. I had them do three sessions of personal storytelling interviewing. So the only data they had on each other were the stories they sh chose to share with each other. Each student was charged to listen to stories, to ask for story, and to tell their own story. And I want to share what ended up happening in the project because their work together culminated in a final performance where each student shared one moment from their lives. And one of the students came up to me before the performance and said, I want to change my story really quickly. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, and when she got up there, she stood next to her storytelling partner from the other school. And they're all from completely different backgrounds. And she shared her story of coming out. Now she shared her story of coming out and being gay. And that story was only one week old. The first and last time she had shared that story was with her best friend slash brother seven days prior. The next time she chose to share it was in a room filled with 36 students, plus their friends, plus their supporters. I had all of the students write a final response of their response to this final performance, and this is what she had to say. I think the magic of this exercise was that we had the opportunity to talk about things that people don't want to talk about, or people secretly do want to talk about, but they are afraid other people don't want to listen. Knowing how to respond, how to genuinely express compassion when someone tells you something really deep, either horrible or wonderful, beyond the scope of the normal pleasantries of conversation is never easy. So we avoid sharing these things because we don't want people to, put, to be put in situations or positions where they would be forced to come up with a response and would be unsure what to say. Though with stories like these, oftentimes the only response needed is a hug because the response is not important. What matters are the words that we've been holding on to and the words we let out. We just need these stories to be heard. And I really love that. I have my time is up. I really love that though because um, it showed that there was a, my intention was for them to not only be given a safe space through my own listening to them, but for them to create safe space with each other. And uh, her come, sharing that story of her sexuality was, and evidence that she felt safe enough to go and access her core and share that core with us. So that's the kind of work I like to create in the world. Thank you all for listening. So I expected to be hiding behind both a podium and a computer. Um, so that will make what I'm gonna start by saying even more relevant, which is that I am generally a fairly shy and also very short person. <laughs> Um, there, there, I think. Oh, and now I can also hear the, my voice in the microphone. All right, so my name is Shana Agate. I do teach here. I teach um, in uh, three different areas, um, and that is actually roughly what I will talk about. The fact that my work is all over the place, but is really only ever about one or two things. Um, I have a very good friend uh, who is a research librarian who I think knows everything, and she um, says, and so I believe her, um, that uh, we only really ever have one or two good ideas. And I tell my, all my students this, and they find it both horrifying and relieving, as I do. Um, and so um, I have the slides that are playing behind me are slides of my work. Um, this is actually a slide of things that I cut out to remind myself of this one or two good ideas thing, because it is affirmed in the newspaper here <laughs> over and over again. Um, the thing that that is on is a map of Manhattan, and I want to talk a little bit about the kind of work I do. So I'm a book artist, but I'm also theoretically a designer, but I kind of backdoored my way into that part. Um, and I also do a lot of teaching around collaboration, and I came to design in part because I'm a visual thinker, and in part because um, I'm interested in the ways in which both designers and activists have a capacity to think about futures that are unimaginable to others. So. 
I began with a kind of romance of design. See, I expected to have this in front of me, so I'm gonna keep dancing around looking to see what we're looking at. So what you have behind me are um, parts of my practice that seem completely unrelated. So on the one hand, editing a radical teaching journal about um, teaching about trans and transgender issues in the classroom, and on the other hand, um, uh, an academic article about the role of theory in teaching design. Um, and you'll keep seeing things that I'm gonna argue um, actually are the same, even though they look entirely different and appear in different places. And this, I think, in fact, is my practice. So the, um, and now what is behind me are um, all the different versions of my bio that I use depending on where it is that I um, am asking people to think about who I am in relationship to what the work is that's happening. And so one of the things, I took a class, and the people in my group heard this earlier, but I took a class with Seku um, almost entirely by accident. I was at Eugene Lang for a semester um, in 1996. Um, and uh, despite having never taken a literature class before, decided to take Poetry of the Black Arts Movement with him. Um, and in many ways that I think I discover again and again, um, Seiko had a huge impact on my capacity to think sort of beyond um, a certain kind of boundary. I was having a great conversation with somebody who was in the 51st Dream State about this over lunch. Um, this, these next few slides um, are grow out of both my teaching practice and my art practice. Um, this is a slide actually with a young person from an organization called the Fortune Society that some of you may know, works with um, formerly incarcerated people. And I've been teaching a class with Fortune for the last five years. The class I teach is a collaborative service design class. Um, and I came to it largely because I do um, a lot of activist work against the prison industrial complex. Um, so prisons, policing, surveillance, the networks that collect those, or connect those things and maybe also collect them. Um, that work is informed in many ways by um, my fundamental belief uh, that all of this kind of action, a lot of what we're talking about today, um, is necessarily uh, about and for self-determination. And I think the notion of self-determination is one that gets thrown out a little bit less because it makes people slightly more uncomfortable than things like equality or um, in an educational environment, diversity. Um, but I'm, I'm continually interested in the ways that self-determination actually plays out in things like design and art practice. Um, so the other thing that I was saying and listening to um, over lunch was this idea that um, there's, there was something that, that in the DVD that we saw um, that I found fascinating about the way that Seku worked and it occurred to me now many, many years later that this is probably what was happening in the classroom and why his teaching was so transformative to me, um, that he had a capacity to, to not be dogmatic and yet be deeply driven by a sense of, in his case, I would say justice, but also uh, a, a sense of capacity for sort of fostering that in others. And I think there is a, we often mistake one for the other um, and a capacity to kind of listen actually as um, Pam was just talking about, this capacity to listen without um, equalizing everything but actually to hear everything, to me, seems a, a particular kind of gift that he had um, and that we can learn from. Let me see where I am in my slides. Um, so this piece right here, um, I wanted to connect to the slide from Fortune. This is a book that I made that's based on interviews that I did with people actually um, before September 11th, I think, um, in New York City. Um, but this, I'm, the, the book I made, it's a sticker book, so each of these is a sticker. Um, this, they're perforated, they're, they are made exactly to fit in one's back pocket. Um, and uh, and the, the, the book itself, um, when the 10th anniversary of September 11th was rolling around, and so it's, I, I guess, just convenient that it's now the 12th anniversary, um, I knew that the city would do a thing that would make me feel disappeared, I guess. Um, because I was here that day, um, and I think that the, the degree to which those of us who didn't have the same sort of response or reaction to what happened on September 11th then sort of what the, the generally accepted response was um, that as time moved along, that there became fewer and fewer ways to articulate what that response might be. So it's complete happenstance because I actually didn't know what the 51st Dream State was about before I walked in this room. Um, that the, the, the piece that was just up there was my own response, an attempt to articulate another definition or another way of articulating safety. So I made those books and I just put them all over the city um, at that time. So I'm being told my time is up, so I'm gonna talk really quickly about this slide, which is a uh, whiteboard that I drew on once um, years and years ago, and then conveniently it won't erase. Um, <laughs> and so I have kept it. 
And it turns out that it encapsulates every single thing about my work, these, two, these, these many separate realms that come together, the, these, this one or two ideas that I have over and over. Um, and on the left um, is a quote from Avery Gordon, who is a sociologist who writes about haunting. And on the right is a quote from David Wonorovich, who is an um, artist and writer and photographer and an everything kind of a person who um, lived and worked in New York City and died the year before I came here. Um, and I'm just going to read that one part in case you can't see it. He came back, this is from his journal, he came back after having some exciting night or two with some young man he met somewhere, and he says, he's having, he's having a lot of feelings. It's like pages and pages of feelings about this young man. And he says, ain't it always a silly mess of senses really now? All this should have been spared from the typewriter. I wonder if I'm alive years from now, will I appreciate this or scorn the very idea of it? this self-searching in the face of a world that kills people with bombs. <laughs> wow, I don't normally get emotional in front of people, what with, with the shyness thing. Um, but I think that this idea is kind of at the heart of the practice that I have, and a lot of what I'm actually seeing kind of come up here today. So despite the fact that um, most of my work tends toward the intellectual, and, and, and except for in my, my art, um, these are the, how did that happen there? Oh, sorry, I asked, um, uh, my time was up faster than I expected. So I, I guess I'll wrap it up just by saying that um, th these are two pieces that are the most recent chunks of my work that I've been doing. The one on the left is actually tracing David Wonorovich and me in Manhattan, um, and it's a project called Call a Wrecking Ball to Make a Window. And the one on the right is um, from design research I'm doing right now, thinking about how design processes function with um, radical activist organizations. And when I looked at the two things next to each other, I realized that they look very much the same, that they are both grids, they are both marks, they are both sort of paths through trying to understand somewhat ununderstandable things. So I will end there, but thank you very much for your time. Mic check. One, uh I, I thought uh, Rasu and I were friends, so the fact that you had the poets come up first and then now we have to just speak is, is unfair. So, you know, and uh, he lied to you as well. I don't have an amazing presentation. I just have a presentation. All right, so real quick, just uh, let me get a quick survey. Uh, how many of you know what a charter school is? Okay, how many of you are in contact with at least two people, two teachers, two former teachers of yours in your K through 12 education? Okay. All right, good. That's your business, not mine, Tito. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to give some quick context um, before I get into what makes our school unique and, and what our approach is. So this is just a map of the US. Um, we are part of the KIPP Network, Knowledge is Power program. A um, bunch of different schools all around the country. There's a bunch here in New York um, in particular. My school, team schools, the KIPP region in Newark. Uh, what's unique is that, yes, KIPP, Knowledge is Power program, but even with us kind of being under the same umbrella of this, this idea of school of choice and power to lead and choices of commitment, all these other values that kind of um, bring us together, it manifests itself differently at the different schools in which uh, you go to. So um, we're, we're team charter schools, Kip Region, you can bring me to the next slide, that's my DJ, boom, get him. <laughs> uh, hit it, there you go, team charter schools. So I was, uh, just to give you some quick context, I was the founder of Team Academy. Uh, we opened up in Newark in 2002. Then we opened up a second, we started with just fifth grade, um, and then we opened up a second middle school, Rise Academy in 2006, opened up our high school, which I now lead at, uh, in 2007. We opened up our first elementary called Spark Academy in 2009. Um, Thrive Academy opened up last year, and we just opened up Seek Academy, which is another elementary school this year, and then next year we already been approved to open up our, uh, what's that, sixth, seventh school, if you, Click it, DJ. Life Academy, which will open up. So we are full K through 12 program. We start with one grade and we add one grade to it after that. Okay, just grab this, I'm sorry. Yo, nah, so. Um, <laughs> so to provide further context. So uh, the, the thing about KIPP schools in, in, in general is that obviously you go to school to read, write, learn, so on and so forth, right? But the idea is that 
we place emphasis on student growth, right? Growth specific to who they are as people, character development, so on and so forth. And, and getting a little bit more sophisticated, that with, a lot of times some schools make the mistake of, uh, you know, drawing a direct correlation between ca uh, character development and following rules, which um, a lot of the rules and stuff that you have to follow aren't moral decisions, so it has nothing to do with character, it's something completely separate. And so we put a lot of emphasis on making sure we make that distinction between what it means to actually adhere to the expectations versus your growth of who you are as a person. And I'll get into that in a minute. All right, so this is, uh, this is called the KIPP Framework for Excellent Teaching. And so the whole idea behind this is that these four buckets go into um, the, you know, basically create the student growth and achievement you need, right? Having, you know, practical knowledge and skills and content knowledge of what you teach, uh, you know, knowing how to plan lessons and execute, um, creating that space in your classroom where kids feel safe and kids can learn, and always starting with self, reflecting on who you are as a person, what you bring to the table, how you interact with others, how you perceive by others, um, and that combination of those things help you at the end of the day drive student growth and achievement. All right. So this is called the circle of influence. Now, in a very technical sense, as with anything, everything is about perspective. If I just took all those uh, words away and just said, arrange them the way in which you want, we probably all could sit here and eloquently say, hey, I'm put school culture in the middle because of this. So I put families in the middle because of this. But what we try to do at our school is basically create this, this shared belief. And so our whole idea is starting with self. Right, you think about your locus of control, the thing that you can influence most is who you are. So at the end of the day, one thing that I, I appreciated about uh, you know, why we all here with Seiku teaching and whatnot is this whole notion of success being a journey, not a destination. So really figuring out who you are as a person, starting with self. We come together collectively, um, ourselves with our staff, and we create the culture, right? the way of life of our school. And what I love about this particular image here is that this school culture is created even before the kids get there. So it's this idea that we are going to create what we want our kids to experience, opposed to students coming here and then from there, we'll decide how it's gonna be, right? And, 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 and the reason why that's super important is because it's this whole idea of being intentional. Oftentimes in professional development, even outside of like doing stuff around, here's how to write a smart aim, here's how to do understanding by design, those things definitely happen. We do a lot of mindset coaching and one of the things is, um, anybody been to a casino before ever? Right? Casinos do a good job of making you do what? Gamble, Gamble and spend money. Right? <laughs> Every single decision that is made at a casino is very intentional with how and what they do to get you to spend money. So we want to take that casino-minded way and be intentional by creating a school where kids are learning um, more about who they are as a person and pushing themselves academically. So here's some things we have engineer wanted. Not an engineer in terms of being an engineer for you know, whatever particular uh, company, but this whole notion of teachers coming in with the idea of creating, helping to create this space so students can uh, thrive and, and flourish. Uh, success being a journey, not a destination. As our students are on a journey, we too are on a journey. So it's important that we always step back and think about who we are, why we do what we do. Kip through college, super important, like this commitment. I asked you guys, how many of you are still in contact with teachers that you had from years ago? And so we want to be the type of school where our students stay in contact, uh, contact with us throughout their entire life. And it's an investment in their journey, right? So it's beyond this semester, this quarter, this year in which you're teaching this particular student. And it's this long-term investment of who they're going to be and who they are as a person. Um, and that's just some of our values. Uh, kid focus in particular. If you can go back, uh, that's one of the most important values because you know beyond the student and what they do in your classroom as a student, this, that's only a part of them. And so this whole idea of really investing in who they are as a person. Um, next slide, please, DJ. Thank you. And uh, here's just a variety of things that we do um, in outside of the academic pieces, right? I mean, in order to compete in this world, even beyond being able to read, write, and do math, you know, there's certain experiences that people from affluent neighborhoods are, you know, have been exposed to that when you have limited resources, you don't have. And so we have to find ways in which to provide our students what we call cultural capital. So summer opportunities, 
taking trips. We have kids that go away to France, Spain. We have some kids that have been in Mexico and Costa Rica doing service learning projects. Um, we have a lot of grade level initiatives. So even on the high school level, we're putting that time, energy, and effort into really creating this, this uh, positive atmosphere and celebrating success and that type of stuff, college tours, so on and so forth, to really empower students, right? And how we engage, how we instruct, and uh, how we interact with them is all about empowering them, giving them the power of choice. Things don't just happen, you make them happen. And so that's kind of just a, a little spill on what we do and how we do. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it, right? And uh, I, I love this quote right here. Super important. Just be, be in, making sure that we're being intentional about how and what we do and why we do it. All right, thank you. Okay. Now that I've seen everyone else do this, I feel like I know how to do it. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so uh, my name is Aisha Jordan. I did study with Sekou in his America Project um, class. And he definitely influenced me before I even got there. He um, came to a theater company that I was a part of in my hometown and did a uh, bunch of his shows, actually, um, and did workshops with an organization that I was in. Um, I then, as part of this organization called Project 2050, have moved on and created kind of an evolution of that called 2050 Legacy. And the idea is that um, it's based on the projection that in the year 2050, people of color will be the major majority in the United States. And uh, kind of what that means for all peoples. You know, where do you want to be? What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? Uh, stuff like that. And we do uh, multidisciplinary social justice theater. So it's an amalgamation of breaking, beatboxing, singing, um, spoken word, dialogue, all that kind of stuff. Um, and right now we're an adult ensemble and we do work with you. So we do workshops um, and we do performances in schools as well as other organizations. Um, so the focus and the way in which we do our art uh, starts with a retreat style of work. So artists come together in a retreat setting where you can not shut out the world but bring the whole world in in this creative space, um, which is you know really collaborative and, and creates honest and amazing work, as well as this kind of charismatic uh, feeling in between the artists. So when you're performing, it's something that not only you as your artists are connecting with each other, but you connect with the audience in a different way, um, and that they can really see that. So um, the way we work is we work off of themes. So for instance, when we were younger, we had like environmentalism. So we had scholars come in and teach us about environment and different ways um, in which that affects us socially, physically, mentally, all those kind of ways. And then we'd go into our tracks. So our tracks were things like beatboxing, breakdancing, and all those other things, and connecting to those issues personally and expressing them artistically. Um, and then we would come out with a full-scale show. So we kind of adopted that um, into our practice now, but elongated it. So we're doing an actual full-scale play, because a lot of our stuff was vignette styles in the beginning, and now it's kind of a full-scale play. And as they mentioned earlier, it's about the end of the world. So <laughs> we're working in this framework of uh, what is the end of the world? You know, is it um, really the end, or is it a beginning? Um, what does it mean for you yourself? Is there different kinds of ends of the world? How many times has the world ended for you? And just looking at the world in this kind of lens. Um, so uh, I have a clip I want to show. I'm not ready to show it yet, but um, one of the ways, like they said, was zombies. Uh, we have environmental ways that the world would end, and just analyzing all these different ways in which not just ourselves look at it, but the world looks at it. So we've been watching a lot of doomsday preppers. I don't know if you guys ever watched that. It's very interesting research. Um, but the style of work we do really looks at the idea of research um, to theater. So it's not only research in these themes and learning about them just in terms of facts and things like that, but learning about yourself. So it's self-research as well, learning, at, learning about how you connect to those things and how those outside world things can connect to you um, and what kind of person that makes you. And I think working with a group of people, it also helps you to decide and figure out who you are as an artist, 
um, the strength of the work that you do and how you can, co can collaborate. Um, and so for us, it's very, it's very um, strong and effective, and we hope that it reaches audiences in the way that we like. Um, so this piece I want to show, um, oh yeah, the group is called 2050 Legacy. So this is just me and my husband, actually, he's a part of the group. Um, this piece is looking at the Trayvon and Zimmerman situation from a different view. Um, and one of our ideas is that uh, this is kind of part of that zombie mentality, um, this protecting home and protecting space, or um, the idea of standing your ground and, and things like that. Um, yeah, so this is a piece. <laughs> Thank you. We are wrapping up our program. Um, we know that you love us because you sat here even though we went over the allotted time. Um, now what do we do? This is over, right? Um, we don't stop teaching. We don't stop engaging we do not stop collaborating. So use this as a springboard to know your peers and figure out ways to collaborate with each other. We have artists in here, we have students in here, we have educators in here. Um, exchange business cards, yes? 
I was just wondering if we could also make a very specific call. Like when you're, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought. No problem. But um, but there's actually some funding at Lang right now to partner with artists and organizations, and I'm not sure that's if very that's been raised. Know. And so I just want to make sure that that's raised because it's over the next year, and there seem to be so many great organizations and artists here. So um, if they proactively want to contact faculty to build those partnerships, um, I, I would we could maybe make that information available. Okay, so for the video, <laughs> how you doing? Um, what is your name? You cannot get away with speaking without <laughs> stating your name, claim, my and name is, situation. My, my name is Kata Yun Chamini. I'm a biology professor at Lyon College, and um, I worked with Sekou when Sekou was at Lyon, and he had a very profound effect on all of my work. So. There you have it. So um, someone speak to her, please. She has money for you. <laughs> <laughs> See how rumors start? Yes, I'm used, I do that all the time. Um, but yeah, so the idea is that there, that's a specific call. But um, if you have business cards, that should be one of the objects you bought today. <laughs> right? Um, share that and figure out ways to collaborate. We have Okello, who's from Uganda. Get his information. Figure out how to support him and his movement um, while he's doing this fundraiser. Um, here in New York, maybe we can support him. Um, and there's other people that need support, so let's figure it out. Um, outside of that, I have to handle some business. Um, this is part of an event series, right? Um, I handle all the humanities, as we call it, which is basically civic, civic engagement, events managed around civic engagement. And you can find our full calendar here, <laughs> right? Um, this picks up at Columbia, and it also picks up uh, with 651 um, next week, I think it is. Yeah, next week, the 22nd. Uh, we are doing a discussion panel in Columbia. We're doing a teaching with the professors at Columbia. Um, and that's what, this is the flyer of the Columbia event. And then lastly, we have the catalogs of Sekou's work, um, support, right outside. Um, and from there, I'm gonna pass it on to Gabrielle. So I want to thank everyone for coming today, and thank you all for so many interesting thing, things that you've shared, the kinds of thoughts that you've shared in terms of the way that you work and the diverse ways that you work. And I want to give you guys one last moment, um, kind of while we're all inspired by some of the things that we've talked about and the things that we've seen today, to reflect on your own practice and to share that with us, because uh, there's so much in this room that we want to make sure that um, we have ways of finding the connections, right? Um, like Pam was saying, kind of finding the connections between strangers' work, we want to act as that catalyst and act as that connector for all of you too. So um, you'll find in your packages that you got on the second page, um, in the same pack that had the um, poem, there's a little questionnaire that we would love for you guys to fill out um, and return back to us, which basically asks to, for you to ask, tell us where do you teach um, the kind of work that you do and the ways in which you might use the kind of work that we've talked about here in your own practice. And if you didn't get to share your object in your group, um, please share it there because one, all of this, all of today, all of what you give to us here will come and be part of the public exchange. Um, and it's a way that we'd really hope that people can stay in contact with each other. So certainly individual contacts, we want to encourage that. Um, and we. We want to share kind of who's been at the symposium, but we also want to make it possible for you to share each other's work via this. So, did you have a question? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, you know what? I will. Um, I'll just put it up on screen, and you can email it to to me. And um, and I will, what I will also do is email since we have all of your emails. Uh, we'll email it out to everybody as well, so you can email it. That would be the best thing. Um, but if you want to take a few minutes and do it now, please feel free. We'd love to hear from you. We also have an opportunity to spend, um, we have videographers who are going to be here until 3 o'clock, and we would love to bring some of your voices into this on video as well as um, the text that you guys are writing down now. Um, so I'd like to invite any of you who didn't get a chance to share your objects to actually share them on camera. Um, with us, and so if you're interested in doing that or talking about any challenges or the work that you do and the ways in which you have done work, um, overcome challenges, 
in ways that you think would be useful to other people in terms of sharing that process, I want to invite you to just join me at the back here, and then we'll go and we'll, you'll have your you know, five minutes of fame um, and to come and take part uh, in the America Project Public Exchange. So thank you all for being here, and um, we look forward to seeing you at many other events and continuing this work. So thank you. Thank you. Great.